There we go. Hello and welcome back. This is Roger Royce. I'm a partner with Haynes Boone in Palo Alto. We do emerging growth and venture capital. I am also the host of the 10,000 Startups podcast. And this week, we are going to talk about Forever Chemicals. Uh, and you might never have heard of Forever Chemicals. You might not know what they are and why you should, should know what they are, but you're going to learn and you're going to be surprised just like I was. Our guest here today is Mary Mendoza. She's a partner with Haynes Boone and also the chair of the Environmental Practice Group. Uh, she advises companies on solutions to environmental issues, including litigation, environmental actions, day-to-day -day compliance, site cleanup, and toxic tort litigation. So Mary, I want to thank you for being here today because uh, this is a topic that I've been wanting to do for a long time and you know, I think it's really important and it's really important for companies to know that they might have some exposure here. Well, no, thank you very much for having me today. I'm excited to come and talk about this. Uh, Haynes and Boone has a, a large and broad ranging environmental practice where we help companies of all sizes from startup to the Fortune 50 company deal with their environmental uh, obligations. And I think sometimes companies are surprised because Environmental law is not contracting. It's reaching into more and more areas and more and more businesses. So people that may not have been subject before are finding themselves subject to environmental law. Yeah. So so pausing on that for a second, because I, you know, I do startups and environmental is usually not on the top of my mind, but uh, but we do have an environmental group and every once in a while I have to pick up the phone and and, and call one of you folks. But tell me, uh, you're in Austin, Dallas, and Fort Worth, but your practice is nationwide, I would gather, on this yes. issue. Yes, we practice all over the country. We've got people in different offices, and uh, most of us have been practicing for a while and have seen issues arise throughout the country. And environmental, that could mean a lot of things, couldn't it? I mean, it could mean like water. It could mean maybe toxics on the property you're on, or in the case we're going to talk about today, stuff that gets into the food and the cosmetics and the products you're selling. Yes. So EPAs uh, at the federal level, and then most states have parallel programs, but the reach is broad. It starts out from the things that you put into the water and the air and you know, onto the soil from your business to actually what you use in your business, what chemicals you can manufacture. There are environmental laws that impose obligations on uh, companies that manufacture new chemicals to register those, people that make representations about properties of their chemicals that may control uh, the growth of, uh, of things. We saw this a lot in COVID when people were selling a product as being somehow resistant to COVID, you know, things that you could spray on your uh, cabinets or on your surfaces to kill COVID bacteria. That actually was that was regulated under environmental law, under the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, which probably many of those people had never heard of before then. Yeah. Well, you know, our agriculture tech clients, of course, certainly have to worry about this. I'm sure our, I think what I'm hearing is the food company clients, yeah. food and beverage, are gonna have to worry yes. about what chemicals are going in their products. Um, and then, of course, anybody who owns real estate. Is there any, you know, out here in in, in the Silicon Valley, uh, we see lots of chemicals being used in the semiconductor industry. So certainly those people have to think about environmental issues. Are there any other industries that, that pop up that might not be obvious that ought to be thinking about compliance? Well, almost every in industry is touched by environmental law. But I think you see it a lot in energy uh, industry. Mm -hmm. You see it, of course, in the chemical industry. Um, you do say every industry, it's a little bit different, but um, a lot of people talk about clean tech and clean tech may be clean on some level. I think people are talking about like it's carbon emissions when they talk about that. It may not be clean in the actual making of the product. Yeah. So that really does, uh, it does impact it. And you're right, the electronics, the semiconductor industry, use a lot of chemicals. And in fact, many of them have used the chemicals we're going to talk about today. Okay, well, let's talk about that. So <laughs> forever chemicals. Uh, so first of all, why do we call them forever chemicals? Well, to, to wander off for a few moments into chemistry. 
Um, the chemicals we're talking about is PFOS. It's a class of chemicals. PFOS stands for per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. And what makes them forever chemicals is that the PFOS chemicals have a carbon fluorine bond. And that is one of the strongest bonds in nature, which means that when it gets out into the, into the soil, into the air, it doesn't break down or it doesn't break down much. And so it doesn't go away. Many of the chemicals we commonly deal with in environmental for a lot of cleanups, say petroleum or solvents, those break down naturally over time. It may be a long time, but they do break down naturally. The PFOS chemicals really don't do that. Or if they do break down, they don't break down very much. So they stick around forever. And because they stick around forever, that means they accumulate. People, there's there are studies out there that talk about them accumulating not only in the environment, but in us when we are exposed to them. So that's why we call them a forever chemical. Okay. Yeah. yeah you, you remind me now, I forgot to mention you have a background in engineering. Uh, yes. So you, you understand the, the, the chemistry side of this. And that makes sense. Now, when you say they stick around forever, like in us, what does that mean? Does that mean that it's like it, it's in a tissue rather than in blood or something like that? Um, well, it's I think it's a little bit of everywhere. There uh -huh. are there are some studies out there that would that estimate that every single person in the U.S. would have PFOS in their blood if it was looked for. Oh. It is ubiquitous. It is hard to imagine we all haven't been exposed in some way. There are still a lot to learn about the health effects of PFAS. Lots of studies are still ongoing. Um, most literature that you look at right now will talk about PFAS as potentially causing lower immune system response, diabetes, decreased infant and fetal growth. Kidney cancer has been one that has been flagged as a potential higher than normal lipid levels or high cholesterol levels. So it's, it's you know, there, there are a lot of studies though still ongoing because while PFOS has been around for a long time, it's really took off, I think, manufacturing in about the 1940s. Um, the, the studies and the science behind it, I think are still catching up. Wow, that's, that's amazing. And how would somebody actually end up, I mean, we'll go to some of the other exposure, but how would an individual, how would you be exposed to this? Would it be through air, through food, through water, or all of the so, above? So far, I think it is an all of the above in a way. So far, most of the exposures that have been studied and regulated have been around um liquid exposure in other words it's in your water or it's in a and then things that you contact things that you eat things that you come in contact with so when you think about the uses of PFAS there, there are lots of uses of them but I'll hit on a few that we'll all recognize non-stick cooking uh non-stick cookware oh no <laughs> now I'm, I'm going to say don't panic because okay. a lot of manufacturers have phased it out by now. Okay. But nonstick cookware, water repellent and stain resistant fabrics and carpets. Hmm. I know that I have bought a sofa that they offered me to spray something on it to make it resist stains. And when I had a young child, that seemed like a great idea. Perhaps not hmm. in this world because undoubtedly that was a PFOS that was being sprayed on it. Um, Grease resistant food packaging is full, has been full of PFAS. Now that has largely been ruled out. I'll cover that a little bit later. And then a lot of cosmetics have had PFAS in it. So there's a lot of action in that area to deal mm. with cosmetics. Wow, it's just everywhere. Um, it is everywhere, it's ubiquitous. Yeah, well, so what is the government doing about this? <laughs> Well, the government is, of course, regulating it. But first, they've studied it. They've studied it a lot. And so, um, you know, at the federal, it's federal and state level regulation for PFAS. Um, 
At the federal level, you have primarily the United States Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA. Mm -hmm. They developed a strategic PFAS roadmap uh, where they've sort of div divvied it up into three buckets. They are researching it to understand PFAS exposures, how we get exposed, and then the toxicities, what that causes. Um, restricting PFAS to prevent future contamination exposure. So regulating its discharge, regulating its manufacture and its use, and then remediating existing PFAS contamination. So those are sort of the three buckets. You also have other agencies like the FDA in particular getting in on it. Um, this has a huge implication for anyone that is in the food industry or in food adjacent type things, food packaging, additives that are in food, anything like that. PFAS is top of mind, I think, for those type of uh, companies. Is that is that a disclosure and labeling issue at the FDA level, or is there really just they test it and you got to keep your levels low, et cetera? It, it's, it's generally keep your levels low, but there are places where there are disclosure requirements. You know, California is absolutely the, at the forefront of disclosure and labeling requirements. So you're seeing that in California. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, at the federal level, it's the, the breadth of the regulation is huge. And okay. it's, it's coming very quickly. Um, in the past two years, probably seen at least four sort of major rulemakings with new obligations on companies. Um, and that's something that's to come. It's really and more is to come, more is to come and more, and some has happened and the, they have, all these regulations usually have lead times. And mm -hmm. so some of these regulations may have been adopted a year ago, but the actual obligation has not kicked in yet. Mm -hmm. And so those are upcoming and we see those in the future. So we have yeah. rules now that are not yet effective and we're expecting additional yeah. rules in the yes. future. At so the federal have... level. Now at the state level, I do want to say it's a little bit different, but I can talk a little bit about federal rules if we want to cover yeah. some of that. Because that's my next topic is, is what is the compliance burden? What does this mean for our companies? So a lot of companies, cl clients that we are advising, mm -hmm. they are concerned about the compliance burden. Part of it is just figuring out, do they have a, do they have PFOS? And thus, do they have a compliance burden? So um, one statute with some recent rulemaking at the federal level is the Toxic Substances Control Act, or TSCA. That is generally their EPA's authority to mandate testing and reporting of chemicals and to regulate the manufacture of new chemicals and the importation of chemicals. And so in October of 2003, they put in a, uh, a put out a new reporting rule where they're requiring companies to take a pretty long look back, back into 2011, 2012 time period on where they have manufactured chemo PFOS chemicals or articles that contain PFAS. But manufacturing in the world of Tosca also includes importing. And so you may think I'm not a client, I'm not a company that manufactures a chemical. I don't have that risk. But if you are a company that imports chemicals or articles, in other words, things, you may fall under the PFAS reporting rule under Tosca. And depending on the size, that reporting obligation kicks in in 2025. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge burden because you have to look back at a decade worth or more of your activities to mm -hmm. determine whether you have an obligation to report. Um, PFAS is also using Tosca to try to stop certain manufacturing of PFAS where they can claim that the chemical had been unregistered in the past or is uh, has been inactive. They're getting a lot of actual judicial challenges to that. They haven't been entirely uh, successful in that move. Mm -hmm. That probably doesn't hit a lot of companies. You really need to be in the chemical manufacturing business yeah. for that. Um, the Toxics Release Inventory Program that EPA administers has added a number of PFAS to the obligations to report. And so facilities in certain industries that are covered by the toxic release inventory program 
have to track and collect and report their data on PFOS releases. So that can include perfectly legal discharges. You just need to have to report that. Um, there are 196 PFOS compounds that were reportable in 2024. And those lists just continue to grow. Yeah. Um, the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, which is the uh, waste disposal authority for EPA that regulates landfills and how people dispose of their waste. They have proposed rules to regulate PFAS as a hazardous constituent, which then will sort of have flow on impacts on how it's handled and how it can be disposed of. Um, the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act or CERCLA, which is also many people call it Superfund. It's the big cleanup sites. It's EPA's massive cleanup program. And mm -hmm. it also establishes private causes of action for people who have, you know, if people get sued under this all of the time for their disposal practices or their contamination that they have caused. And they have listed a number of PFAS under that. And then the Safe Drinking Water Act is probably the most recent rulemaking where that EPA has established national drinking water standards for several PFAS. And these levels are incredibly low for how much PFAS can be in drinking water from public water systems. We're talking in the parts per trillion range. That's like less than a drop in an Olympic sized swimming pool. <laughs> And, and when I say public water systems, many people tune out because they think that doesn't apply to me. But a public water system is actually much broader than what most people think. It is any system that serves more than 25 people. So if you have a facility in an area where you don't have a water supply system and you instead rely on well water and you've got 25 or more employees at that facility on a regular basis, you are a public water supply system. We mm -hmm. have many clients that didn't realize they were public water supply systems, but they are because they're relying on well water or they're drawing themselves out of a river or a lake and treating it. And all of a sudden now they're going to be subject to the Safe Drinking Water Act limits on PFAS, which also include testing and reporting for PFAS. Wow. So it's, it, it's, I could go on and on. There's nothing yet under the Clean Air Act, but that's probably on the horizon. Mm -hmm. And then many states take these federal programs and implement them through their own analogous state program. So most of these that I've talked about, with the exception of like Tosca and CERCLA, there are analogous state programs where the federal government delegates authority to the states. Oh, I see. So and then, yeah. yeah. And then one other thing I wanna talk about is, uh, I, I miss talking about this, the Safe Drinking Water Act limits, where it's talking about drinking water standards. What I think most people expect is that those drinking water standards will then back themselves into wastewater discharge standards as states seek to protect the drinking waters by regulating what's discharged into the streams and the rivers and their lakes that are the sources of their drinking water. And so industries that discharge their process water may find themselves having limits placed on their PFAS and requirements to treat or to test for PFAS mm -hmm. on their process discharges. Mm -hmm. Well, that kind of brings me to, I mean, this all sounds just overwhelming, the number of different agencies that can administer this federal and state, and we haven't even talked about local very much, and then all the different laws that might apply. I mean, in terms of a compliance program, I mean, what, what's a company to do? I mean, where do they even start? Well, I, you know, I did want to, I talked a lot about the federal and how states may implement that. Yeah. I do want to touch back on just the states for a second, because yeah. there are a number of states that have been at the forefront of PFAS uh, regulation. Okay. And that what those states have been doing is they have been putting in PFAS bans independent of federal law. And so you have a number of states that have banned the sale of firefighting foam with PFAS. 
PFAS is ubiquitous in firefighting foam. Um, it makes the firefighting foam an excellent firefighting foam. But many states are now banning that. And there are alternatives out there. Many in industry would, that depend heavily upon excellent firefighting, such as refineries, airlines, things like that, may say that there aren't really, the other alternatives aren't as good. Um, many states have already banned, without exception, the use of PFAS in food packaging. Some have banned the use of PFAS in children's products. Some have banned intentionally added PFAS broadly. Um, Colorado, for example, bans the sale or distribution of any product containing intentionally added PFAS, including carpets and rugs and food packaging and oil and gas products and children's products. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, there are, some of these are phasing in, some of them are already effective, but it is a patchwork of regulations throughout the U.S., which increases the compliance burden because you have to look at where you are selling your product and whether mm -hmm. it's impacted by that, if you happen to have PFAS in it. So if you're in, uh, if you're a company in California and you're selling your product into Colorado, you have to comply with that Colorado rule. You, so. you, yes, or or even more, if you're a pro, if you're a company here in Texas selling your product into California, you better be looking really carefully at California's rules. Yeah, I I gotta believe we have tough rules here on this. California does. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah everything else. Okay. Well, is there anything else that our audience should know about PFAS now that they've been alerted to the issue and the regulatory risk? I, well, I guess I, we didn't really talk about the penalty if you get it wrong. Well, I mean, as, as with any environmental law, there are, you know, administrative, civil, and criminal penalties for getting it wrong. Criminal um, so someone could go to jail over this. Somebody could go to jail over it. People ha do go to jail over um, over environmental crimes, over getting it wrong. Um, mm -hmm. Usually there's a, a fairly decent um, intent requirement, but not always. It, some of the statutes, the Clean Water Act notably, have some pretty low intent requirements mm -hmm. for it. So it certainly is something that could result in pretty significant fines and penalties. EPA generally assesses fines and penalties, or they are enabled to assess them on a per day, per event basis. And that really begins to rack up when it's several thousand dollars a day. Yeah. Um, but talking about looking forward, what we see most, you know, most companies are looking hard right now at whether they have PFOS, whether they're current, most are trying to, sort of stop the, stop ha making it any worse. So looking hard at what you're using now and determining if it has PFAS in it. And if it does, do you have a substitute? And if it does have PFAS in it and you have no substitute, what regulations may apply to you in terms of both reporting and the regulatory part, but also in the sale of any product that may have it in it? Okay. That that's a that's probably the most um, proactive thing that companies are doing right now. Then, of course, looking at if you have PFAS, looking at do you need to be reporting releases of it? Do you need to be reporting use of it? And then some companies, if they think they have used PFAS, are doing that hard look back to comply with the report the TOSCA reporting rule for past manufacture. So in other words, manufacture or import, if they've been importing something, most companies are looking at that. I think a lot of companies, though, are looking at how do you phase it out of your system and how do you stop it from coming back into your system? Mm -hmm. And that can be a difficult process because it's not just your environmental department, it's your manufacturing department. It's whoever's doing procurement. If, you're, you, know, if you have a separate procurement arm in your company, making sure that everybody's aware of sort of the PFOS issues, knows how to spot it, and knows mm -hmm. how to keep it out of the system. Okay, and you've been saying TOSCA, that's that's toxic substances, what, what control. is that? It's the control. Toxic, to toxic Substances Control Act. It's oh. sort of EPA's general chemical program. Okay, gotcha. So, so people could look that up. 
Okay, well, th that's a lot. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I thank you for this. I think this will be a, of interest, uh, both to companies that are in space and even just to us consumers to know that there's one more thing out there <laughs> that we need to be concerned about. Well, it's, um, it, it's very interesting. It's very fluid. So um, mm -hmm. I I advise everybody to take a hard look at it. And we we post updates pretty regularly as new things happen. So yeah, uh, for sure. We'll keep an eye on the updates because it sounds like things are going to be developing uh, uh, ongoing and the <clears throat> compliance is going to increase, not decrease as we go forward. And updates will be on the Haynes Boone website, I assume, right? Yes, yes. Great. Okay, well, I want to thank you, Mary. This is Roger Royce with the 10,000 Startups, Startups Podcast. I've been speaking with Mary Mendoza. She is the chair of our environmental practice group and a partner with Haynes Boone. Uh, we've been talking about Forever Chemicals and uh, PFOS. So thanks again, and we'll see you all next time.